starting text, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. I guess that does sound pretty good. We've been given eternal life by the eternal one. That, that's, that's, that's the best you can get. It doesn't seem right that you could be given eternal life by someone who himself is not eternal, does it? I'm going to use this example, but it's something I'm passionate about. It's one thing to eat Mexican food out of a freezer package. It's another thing to go to someone who is familiar with that culture to make it for you in their home because they're familiar with it. They can make the real stuff for you, and it's just different. It's better that way. God is familiar with eternal, like that. The entire scope of what eternal means and the ramifications of it cannot really be comprehended by these minds, these brains we have inside our skull. I mean, maybe a book definition of always has been there, is here, and always will be, but past that, it just transcends our thought processes. So I say God has always been there. So we say we go back through history and thank God God was there for all of history. But it goes farther than that because we have record in John of in the beginning. That was before the world. That was before history. I've heard an illustration. You, history is only his story. God is the author, the producer, and the director. Our minds are captured within time and space. So we're kind of narrow-minded when it comes to understanding eternal. But God is greater than human history in terms of how long have you been here? Because he's the one who authored it to start with. So this one that is eternal has given us eternal life. Sounds like a good setup. Okay, so now put this into context. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So explain this to me. How does people who have been that have eternal life? Well, that's the part that's called gospel. You know, it's called good news for a reason. Gospel is good news. And to be this, walking according to the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil. In case you didn't know, that's the devil. We walked according to his road. We've been given eternal life. That's good news. The angels proclaimed on the night of Jesus' birth, good will toward men, and they weren't kidding. Jesus wasn't like other men. In part, men die because they were born. This is kind of a little bit of redundancy here, but if you're not born, you will not die. Life will not end if it never started in the first place, obviously. But with Jesus, that reasoning worked backwards. Men begin with a birth, and later on down the road, they die as a result. Jesus started with a death. And birth came as a necessary means to that end. That was a new thought to me. He had to die to atone for sin. That's what had to happen. But if he wasn't born into a fleshly body first, that couldn't happen. He just, just talked about God reversing nature. That, that's exactly what happened. See, men usually don't look forward to death. But Jesus' death was the initial intended purpose. That's why he was born. Jesus did look forward to death for that reason. Because his death was of more import than of other men. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word, or the Word was with God and the Word was God. So he was equal with God in the beginning as the Word. So God says, let there be light. That word goes forth, performs the command, and there was light. He fulfilled the purpose of God or the will of God. Later, he was signed in the form of the flesh and became the son of God. So there, here the, the, nature, uh, the nature of the work changes, 
But Christ is still fulfilling the will of the Father. God doesn't do anything without a purpose. We all know this. So what was the purpose behind the incarnate word? Well, he did restore sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf. Yes, he did. He healed paralytics and calmed storms and walked on the surface of the water in the middle of a storm. Yes, he did. He gave the disciples a couple huge, miraculous catches of fish. And on occasion, he raised the dead. He did all that. That was all beside the point. Those instances were only byproducts of God being found in form as a, of a man. It was all, it was all a sideshow. In, in, in Jesus, creation found a man that it could obey. It was raining earlier today. If one of us had walked outside those doors and said, stop raining, it wouldn't have stopped raining. Because creation doesn't obey us. We're men. When God came as a man, creation listened. So, it was all a sideshow, if you want to say it that way. Jesus' miracles were not the point of him coming, or else he would have done nothing but that for 33 years. But he didn't. He came to die. Sure, he multiplied food. He did, twice at least, that we have record of. I, I see the work that goes into feeding about 100 people, and it's a lot of work. Jesus multiplies food for once a batch of 5,000 men. That's not including women and children. And then another for 4,000. Yeah, that's, that's miraculous. Well, how about this? God died. How's that for miraculous? In form of a man, but he died nonetheless. That's pretty miraculous too, I think. It went further than just the fact that he died, though. It was a whole lot more of what he accomplished in his death than just the fact that he died. On that, the very day that he died, there were two malefactors on his sides. One to his left, one to his right. They died because of what they did wrong. Jesus died for what you did wrong. He took your punishment and tread the winepress of the wrath of God alone, by himself. He did what no other man could do in dealing with sin effectively. Men could not violate God any longer without some sort of atonement being made. The blood of bulls and goats, they didn't atone. But the innocent blood of Christ did. Sin had to be done away with. Okay, so now consider this. Only a man could take away sin. Because a man caused it in the first place. 1 Corinthians 15, 21. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. So only a man for a sacrifice. But the sacrifice had to be, a, had to be spotless. So now there's a problem for all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that would be a little bit of a difficulty to work around. Because that rules out the possibility of anyone dying for it up to this point. That verse in Romans, it emphasizes the utter uselessness of the human race up to this point. So now switch scenes to the heavenly court. This is Revelation chapter 5, verse 2. John says, I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? So that this is referring to the fulfillment of God's will, once again. Who is worthy to look on the book, who can see what needs to be done, and loose the seals thereof, and accomplish what needs to be done. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, not even under the earth, was found worthy or able to open the book, neither to look thereon. They couldn't even look. They couldn't even see what needed to be done, let alone take care of it. And no man in heaven. You see, this, is, this isn't a good situation. And John knows it. He goes on and says, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And from what I understand, from what Brother Given has said when he's been in foreign countries, weeping is not what you think it is, necessarily, unless you've been to other countries like Brother Given has. 
I get the picture that it's probably a whole lot more than a half-hearted sob. Let's just say that. There is a good reason for weeping here because no one is found worthy to do what God needs done. It's not good for us, and more importantly, it's not good for God that no one is found to do what he says. And then, one of the elders saith unto me, weep not. So how, how good does that sound? No one's found to do what God needs done. Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals thereof. So Jesus has fit the bill. God needs a spotless lamb, and Jesus was it. The one who was slain since before the foundation of the world was qualified to take away the sin of the world, past, present, and future. He was qualified to take away the sin of the world as far as the east is from the west. The result is sanctification. It's an ongoing process, but that, in part, was the result. We didn't sanctify ourselves. The blood of Jesus Christ has bought us. So my, my attempt at a loose definition of sanctification is to be set apart by means of purification. So in the Old Covenant, God would tell the people, you sanctify yourself a lamb, or whatever he's referring to, sanctify it. You set it apart, it has to be perfect to be used only for me. That's what God had said. That's obviously not everything entailed in sanctification, but that is part of it. And this is, what, this is what's happened to us. We've been set apart. This is, this has been, it's been said before. We've been set apart to be used only for the Lord. Because sin has been removed. The void of sin is gone. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And signifying that the way to God has been opened. An illustration that I like to use is that since it was torn from the top to the bottom, ruled out any question of, okay, which one of you guys did this? Which one of you got your scissors and went and cut, cut the temple veil? You're in trouble now. For, for one thing, it was made of fabric that was too thick to tear or cut anyway. It was about as thick as a man's hand is wide. That, that's tough stuff. And then the fact that it was torn from top to the bottom. So it was too tall for anyone to get up there with destructive intentions anyway, even if they could do something. No man tore the veil. Jesus made a new and living way. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. If you're offering yourself to God as a living sacrifice, chances are you don't have much time for anything else. Brother Eric just brought this out. It's a full time obligatory operation. Occupation. That's what I meant to say. You're obligated to do this. It, it does go further than obligation. It has to do with mind change and heart change, so your desires are changed as well. But you have to. And those who don't are going to be damned in the end as a result. The blood of Christ is too valuable. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Not everyone is all of those things. If God doesn't make you that, you're not going to be that. This is all made possible by the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we behold him, like John told his disciples, behold the Lamb of God, look at him. And we've looked at him, and we're saved. When you've been made chosen, royal, holy, and peculiar, you're going to live like it. God doesn't change men without a noticeable positive effect. So on a work of this scale especially, there will be a very good distinction between you and other men when God changes. Here in part is what happened in sanctification, Ephesians 2.13. In Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. We were dead to God. A dead person is unresponsive and therefore unproductive. You can poke and you can prod a dead man all you want and try to convince him to do something. But one, he won't tell you to stop what you're doing. Stop bothering me. I don't want to do it. He won't get up and do what you said. He won't even try to stop you from annoying him, if you want to say it that way. He's dead. It's not going to happen. 
That's what death is. You're disconnected. We were dead to God, unresponsive and unproductive. We are now sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. We are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's the only way to be made nigh, by the way. You can't, God put our feet into a firm place. We didn't walk up there by ourselves. In short, we've been bought with a price. Again, this is what Brother Eric said. Therefore, glorify God in your body and spirit, which are God's. There's no better place to be than in the, under the mighty hand of God after submission. Like Peter said, submit yourself under the mighty hand of God. And the, Christ's blood has enabled us to be there. One more text. 1 Corinthians 6, first part of verse 9 and verse 11. The, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified by the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God.